Although today's featured song was written to be <laughs> entirely tongue in cheek, its humor was almost completely lost on listeners. In fact, this fist in the air rocker it was so power packed, the legions lined up to crown its creators the lords of rock and roll. By then, it was too late to convince anyone that they were more or less joking. Now, is this smash hit rock's greatest battle cry anthem, written by rock's ultimate guitar heroes? Or are the band's faithful followers getting more than just a little carried away? Find out next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you've ever listened to albums and uh, songs backwards to seek out the, the hidden messages that you think are there, you're going to dig this channel of Music Nostalgia. Make sure that you subscribe below right now. Really think you'll dig it. Now, in the two years since Led Zeppelin lifted off in 1968, Robert Plant, Jimmy Page, John Paul Jones, and John Bonham had sailed a great distance across the sky. Two best-selling albums, hundreds of concerts on both sides of the Atlantic, and congregations of faithful fans had all fueled their flight through the stratosphere. For better or worse, uh, this frenzied rocket ride to fame wasn't slowing down. The need to get bigger it kept accelerating, and the members of Zeppelin were really feeling the fatigue. In the first few months of 1970 alone, Zeppelin had toured uh, the UK, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Switzerland, Germany, and Austria. And they put in an exhausting fifth circuit across America. As spring arrived, band members were ready for a breather. And for Plant and Page, this took the form of an extended rustic retreat into the middle of nowhere. Their destination, Bronyarar, uh, an 18th century cottage in Snowdonia, Wells, where Plant had a vacation as a child. Uh, tranquil and primitive, they live without running water, electricity, or a telephone. It was perfect silence from the world at large. They would be joined only by Robert's family, Jimmy's girlfriend, and a couple of roadies. There in the countryside, Page and Plant wrote together, really for the very first time. And songs seemed to emerge out of the ether as they roamed the hills, you know, followed the streams, and sat by the fireplace, guitars in hand. It was the first time I really came to know Robert, is what Page said, actually living together at Bronyarar, as opposed to occupying nearby hotel rooms. The songs took us into areas that changed the band. It established a standard of traveling for inspiration, which is the best thing a musician can do, end of quote. Now, this creative getaway provided Page and Plant with new material for Zeppelin's third record, as well as future albums, really. When their time was done, Page and Plant left their pastoral uh, sanctuary rejuvenated. And early in the summer of 1970, they rejoined Jones and Bonham to run through the songs for Zeppelin III. So gathering at Headley Grange in the Hampshire countryside, and with the help of the Rolling Stones mobile studio, they got to work rehearsing. Later, they recorded at Olympic Studios in London and Island Records, uh, Basin Street Studios in Notting Hill. And uh, mixing took place in August at Ardent Studios in uh, Memphis while the band was on their, their sixth uh, U.S. tour. Seems like there's no shortage of opinions about what Led Zeppelin is supposed to sound like, particularly back in the 60s and 70s while they were on their historic run. Uh, between critics and some of the more dogmatic fans, there was a close-minded reluctance to accept any Zeppelin adventures into new sonic territory. I mean, take Houses of the Holy and In Through the Outdoor, for example. Uh, both subverted audience expectations and experimented with musical style. And both albums took some pretty serious heat. Oh, now, Zeppelin III is another case in point. It stirred up a ruckus in its day as well. Their first two albums, you know, Led Zeppelin had unleashed a furious onslaught of heavy blues and pounding electric rock. And though three would have its hard rock moments, 
The album was largely built around a, a more acoustic folk focused sound. How's it bring me Plant would describe fan expectations this way. It was like, you know, where's our whole lot of love part two? But even worse than disappointed fans were the critics who savaged the album. They were pretty damning. Page in particular was really brought down by the hammering that they took from the press. Years later, he would say, with three, they didn't really understand what we were doing, acoustic music but it was already all over the first album. I've said in the past that I'll give it the benefit of the doubt that maybe reviewers only had a short time to review the album because it went totally over their heads, really. The Rolling Stone review was a definite hatchet job. We were told that. It didn't matter. We had a bigger circulation than Rolling Stone. I love that. Regardless of what anyone else said, the four members of Led Zeppelin were pleased with their work. All these years later, it's, it's a masterpiece. According to Robert Plant, after the completion of Three, the sky was the limit. This album was the proof that they could change and it meant that there were endless possibilities and directions for this band to go. Now, Zeppelin Three was released on October 4th, 1970 in the US and on October 23rd in the UK. Uh, the record topped the charts in both places and stuck around for 40 weeks in the UK and 19 in America. But for all the talk of Zeppelin Unplugged, there's at least one song on three that rocked as much as anything in this catalog of this band, or in anyone else's for that matter. It's the explosive side one opener, Immigrant Song. Fight the whole, sing and cry. Now, as we get into the origin of this all-time rocker, I want to thank Bespoke for sponsoring this edition of Professor of Rock. Bespoke is a membership service that will send you curated boxes of great products every month that are customized just for you. It's free to join. All you do is take the simple quizzes shown here. That tells Bespoke what you like and what you don't like. You'll get a preview of what they're sending you. And before it ships, you can choose what you want. You can swap it out for a different box or skip a month if that's what you want at no charge. It's your call. And then Bespoke will send you some really cool stuff valued around $70, but you pay a fraction of the price. You only pay for what you want. And after I signed up and I took the quiz, I received three boxes in one. Uh, products assigned especially for me. I got the destination box right before I went on this big road trip, and it was exactly what I was hoping for with items that would help me to pack lighter and smarter, plus I need my wardrobe organized without getting wrinkled. I also received a box called Slash where I picked out this machete that I can't wait to use to clear a campsite on our next family camping trip. I also received the Weekender box, and I love that too. 90% of the products in Bespoke Post boxes come from small businesses, many of which are based in the U.S. Click on the link in the description below to join Bespoke and include the on-screen promo code to get 20% off your first box. Enter the promo code at checkout and you'll be good to go to start getting your personalized boxes every month from Bespoke. Immigrant Song has a different origin story from the album and begins after Page and Plants Brown Your R sabbatical in June of 1970. In between writing, rehearsing, and recording, Zeppelin filled their calendar in with concert performances. Either these guys were the ultimate workaholics or their manager, Peter Grant, was the ultimate slave driver. Maybe it was a little of both. But one of these tour dates took them to Iceland, where they played a cultural exchange show. Uh, and this was on uh, June 22nd. Uh, however, the gig was almost canceled because of a worker strike that was going on at that time. Said Robert Plant, we were invited to play a concert in Reykjavik. And the day before we arrived, all the civil servants went on strike and the gig was going to be canceled. Uh, the university prepared a concert hall for us and it was phenomenal. The response from the kids was remarkable and we had a great time. Uh, it turns out that uh, Robert Plant was so affected by this experience that he began writing about it. Uh, Zeppelin's journey to the land of the midnight sun directly inspired the power-packed two and a half minute saga of Viking conquest in Norse mythological imagery. Iceland, which was settled by these seaborne Scandinavian conquerors, fittingly became the launching point for one of rock history's most intense driving guitar hero anthems. Immigrant Song 
has all the, the fist in the air, rock and roll explosiveness that Led Zeppelin fans had come to expect from the band's previous two albums. This is simply one of Led Zeppelin's greatest compositions, and that's saying a lot. Fast, loud, in your face, Immigrant Song is the backing track of a band going to war. Cutting foes asunder, the plant kicks off the vocal carnage with a chilling banshee-like battle cry. It's absolutely otherworldly. And he's calling down the, the gods of Norse legend to fall into formation behind him. Jimmy Page, as usual, just kills it. This multi-talented musician took on the roles of you know, composer, guitarist, arranger, and producer for this song and the album. His simple but insanely effective guitar riff is hypnotic and thunderous. And Bonzo's galloping drum beat, it gives you the feeling that you're, you're riding headlong into combat. And of course, Jonesy, instead of bringing his bass line in at the same time as the drums, he waits for the first verse, increasing his impact and effectively relaunching the song. Look, this is Zeppelin at their most powerful. And to be honest, the only thing wrong with the song is it's only two minutes and 26 seconds. Leaves you wanting more every time that the clock runs out. The immigrants reference in the title are ancient Viking marauders, as the lyrics make clear. Robert Plant was fascinated with history and mythology, and this song, he combines both of them, exploring the Viking invasion of the British Isles and elements of Nordic legend. The song opens with the lyrics, we come from the land of the ice and snow, from the midnight sun where the hot springs flow, a double-sided reference, land of the ice and snow refers to both the Viking homeland and Iceland where Zeppelin had recently traveled from. The line, the hammer of the gods will drive our ships to new lands, that tells us straight off that this isn't some diplomatic mission. This is conquest. According to Norse legend, it was Thor who wielded the hammer of the gods. He was associated with storms and strength, controlling lightning with his hammer and wreaking havoc on his enemies. Though feared by many, he was also a mighty protector of his people, and he pushed their prosperity. When Plant sings of Valhalla, he is referencing the final resting place valiant Viking souls fallen in battle. Valhalla was believed to be a grand hall in Asgard, the home of the gods where heroes prepared for the final fateful battle of Ragnarok. Um, as the song continues, Robert Plant sings, on we sweep with threshing oar, our only goal will be the western shore. Again, we are presented with visions of conquest. Now, historically, the British Isles were one of those western shores, singing a soft build, so green, whispering the tells of gore. Plant has us imagining the bloody battles that these fields once saw. So green. And from the Vikings' perspective, they are the ones who calmed the tides of war and rightfully became overlords. But it's much more menacing tell from the view of the conquered. So now you'd better stop and rebuild all your ruins. So now you better stop and rebuild all your ruins. For peace and trust can win the day despite of all of your losing. Peace and trust can win the day despite of all your losing. The song tells the tale of battle-bound glory, but leaves us with a subtle and cautionary message. Victory is often a one-sided affair. History, they say, is written by the winners, but while the champions see peace and trust winning the day, the conquered may well see subjugation and forced obedience instead. But what I find interesting is that Led Zeppelin, an English band, took on the perspective of Viking people uh, who had historically laid waste to their homeland. Seems counterintuitive, but maybe Robert, being a history buff, was just really fascinated by the story. Regardless, with Plant going on about Viking plunder, many fans quickly drew parallels to Zeppelin as they toured the world, took over the world. 
Robert and company were likened to the Conquerors and the hordes to the legions of Led Zeppelin fans. It's not hard to see a heroic connection there when you're hearing plants sing Valhalla, I am coming. Was Zeppelin really calling themselves the new musical overlords? I mean, you could even say that Western lands was a reference to America, a distant voyage away. I mean, Zeppelin had already toured there several times in an effort to increase their, their visibility and fan base, but it was still new territory to be subdued. A lot of fans actually interpreted the song this way, and a lot of them were ready to comply, to give themselves up body and soul to these modern gods of rock. But as fitting a metaphor as it may have been, the tone of the song, according to Robert Plant, was nothing of the sort. Robert Plant said it was meant to be tongue in cheek. He said, immigrant song was supposed to be powerful and funny. But people go, Zeppelin had a sense of humor? He said they weren't being pompous. The band had literally just come from the land of ice and snow when they wrote the song. But whether the song was intended to be a, a wink to Zeppelin's massive popularity or not, they had nevertheless just forged a mighty hammer of their own. Immigrant song would be used with great effect to drive their own ambition and strike awe and wonder into audiences across the globe. Take for example, the first time they played the song live. Immigrant song was just six days old when Led Zeppelin uh, debuted at uh, England's Bath Festival. Yeah, it was on June 28th, 1970. The event was a prestigious opportunity to play in front of a home crowd of heroic proportions. Actually estimated there was between 150 and 200,000 people in attendance. This was Zeppelin's biggest crowd of their career up to that point. So they had to put on a show that no one would ever soon forget. That night, they took the stage uh, directly after Jefferson Airplane, if memory serves, uh, just as the sun was setting. Now, the timing was perfect and intentional. Aware of the significance of the massive gig, manager Peter Grant had checked the exact time of sunset so that Zeppelin could have uh, the spectacular backdrop. To achieve this, he even had a group called The Flock hauled off stage when they began to overrun their set earlier that evening, so the timing was right. And believe it or not, I'm gonna let a critic tell the rest of the tale. Melody Maker's Chris Charlesworth was there that night. And journalist or not, even he felt the impact of this song. Uh, recounting hearing Immigrant Song, he said, and I quote, they played just as the sun was setting behind the stage and mighty impressive they were too. They opened their set with the hitherto unreleased Immigrant Song, which they attack with all the ferocity of the marauding Vikings. Robert was singing about, drums and bass reverberated like cannon fire. Page's guitar cut through the twilight like a broadsword. Every other band on this bill sounded decidedly limp dick compared to this onslaught. Now, that was his exact quote, but I have to say, well put. <laughs> it's nice to know critics can get it right every once in a while. I'm just kidding. But imagine if that is how the enemy felt, to quote Stillwater's Russell Hammond and Almost Famous. The rest of the audience must have really been blown away. There can be little doubt that Immigrant Song was the hammer of the gods. I mean, this song just gets inside your skin. I remember working with my dad out in his shop. I was a little kid. He would play his eight tracks and Zeppelin was a constant. So we just finished, or he had just finished playing a Neil Diamond album. Went from Solitary Man to the opening track of Zeppelin III Immigrant Song. I mean, it jolted me out of my boredom. So I was sitting there sweeping, my dad walked over to me, he grabbed my broom and he started playing air guitar and he got right up in my face. You know, face to face, he started lip syncing. Ah, you know, from the land of ice and snow, from the midnight sun where the hot springs flow. He was going at it and he started twirling around, singing and shouting. It was hilarious. The fact that my dad listened to Zeppelin and Alice Cooper, Black Sabbath, it was a bragging right that none of my friends could top. There was always the, the dumb, my dad could beat up your dad. But my response always shut, it shut him down. 
My dad listens to Zeppelin, and your dad listens to Conway Twitty. <laughs> Watch that dark. How am I doing? Although Led Zeppelin is typically seen as an album-oriented group, Immigrant Song was actually one of their few hit singles. Released with Hey, Hey, What Can I Do on the flip side on November 5th, 1970, it climbed to number 16 on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100, and it stayed on the chart for 13 weeks. Now, it broke the top 20 in a slew of countries, going to number 20 in Australia, number 13 in Japan and Austria, number 9 in the Netherlands and in Spain, number 7 in South Africa, number 6 in Germany, Number four in Canada, New Zealand, and Switzerland, and number three in Denmark. Immigrant Song has appeared in several movies over the years, including Soldier in 1998, Life on Mars in 2006, Shrek the Third in 2007, <laughs> Girl with the Dragon Tattoo in 2011, And of course, Thor Ragnarok in 2017. And then there's School of Rock in 2003, starring Jack Black. And though the placement was brief, it has a good story behind it. Jack Black, of course, a diehard Zeppelin fan, filmed himself singing Immigrant Song on stage and uh, begging the gods of rock to let him use the song in the movie. We need your song, man. We need the immigrant song. The play actually worked. After Paige Plant and Jones saw it, they gave Black permission. Now, it may seem corny, but it worked, is what Jack Black said. The moral of the story is don't be too proud to beg. It also doesn't hurt to have your own horde of fans backing you up. <laughs> immigrant song has been covered many times, Great White in 87. Nirvana in 88. Moby, 2005, Vanilla Fudge in 2007. Ann Wilson and Hart, members of Yes, Nazareth, Chris Cornell. Trent Reznor, Greta Van Fleet. And Foo Fighters with Slash and Jack Black in 2015. I mean, you think about it, Immigrant Song really was an example of where life imitated art. Led Zeppelin held the hammer of the gods, and they did become the overlords of rock. <music> Leave us a comment about Led Zeppelin and Immigrant Song. What are your memories of this rocker? Um, it's just such a great song. What are your favorite parts? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our other Zeppelin installments. From Zeppelin 4, we've got Black Dog. From Houses of the Holy, we've got Rain Song. Uh, from Physical Graffiti, we've got Cashmere. And don't forget to subscribe below so that you never miss out on our videos. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.